Good evening. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second uh, installment of Child USA's film series in 2021. Uh, we're not yet in a theater, but we are hoping to be in person uh, someday in the fall, as well as keeping the, this um, virtual part of it. This is uh, really uh, an impressive and interesting uh, gathering of experts on the issue of online cyberbullying and, and frankly, suicide. Um, but it, it's also uh, a different take on these issues. You know, we started our first film series, first film in our series was with uh, Dr. Liz Goldman, who we're delighted to have with us tonight, and Sarah Klein. Uh, and about their relationship, and uh, it really was uh, a moving discussion. So I think we're going to have a different topic, and I, I think just as uh, valuable and moving discussion tonight. Well, this is a topic that is on in the headlines too much. It's tragic, um, but I'm I'm really glad that we're here uh, tonight, in particular with uh, Sharon Cooper and Dr. Liz Goodman to talk about the science of this and, and how do you deal with these issues. So what I'd like to do is to start with Dr. Cooper and to ask you, you know, the, the tragedy here is that online exploitation, once it's out there, you can't pull it back. Uh, and so it is just a repetitious uh, way of assaulting someone in addition to the sexual assault itself where this started. So how does, um, how does this kind of uh, online exploitation affect the victim uh, in addition to the actual assault? How, how are those different or the, and similar? I think it's really important to understand that when we think of sexual assault, we typically think of a crime between two individuals, an offender and a victim. And uh, when there is an online component, however, of this particular type of crime against a person, you have one victim and multiple offenders. Multi-offender cases are much, much worse from the perspective of psychological impact, from the perspective of never feeling safe, from the uh, perspective of having a rational paranoia, thinking that people will always recognize you, even though people may never have seen you, but it doesn't matter. In your mind, you think someone is looking at you and perhaps recognizing you. And it is not something that uh, is easily um, overcome, number one. And number two, it's not a type of victimization that many um, mental health care providers are familiar with and uh, can just uh, say the types of things or try to lead uh, victims uh, beyond that fact. And I think the other aspect of this type of victimization is that you want to think that as time goes on, it will get further and further in the rearview mirror of your life. However, so often that is not what happens. I have had victims who had circumstances very similar to this, who uh, left school, were, their parents were able to send them to a school in another state. They were gone for three years. They went away to college. And then their sophomore year, four years later, they come back home to visit their family. And the mother was able to uh, intercept a, a voicemail message saying, hey, I just saw pictures of you. You want to get it on, on the voicemail of her family home. So this is one of those dynamics that is extremely important, one for us to begun to understand and to become more versed in how to help uh, survivors in this situation. Thank, thank you so much. I mean, I think that's a, a great way for us to start the discussion. I want to Welcome Delaney Henderson, uh, a brave survivor who is joining us this evening. And um, Delaney, I, I know that like so many survivors, you're just not going to watch this kind of a film. You know, we did a 10 minute clip so that everybody in the audience would have the flavor of it. But we really wanted you here for your extraordinary courage and your insights. So, um, 
Could you tell us about your involvement with this film um, and, uh, and give us some insights into how you feel about these things? Yeah, um, it's funny because I everybody asks me like all the time, you know, like, oh, like, do you like the film? Like, what did you think about it? Everything. And um, I always have to respond because I've never actually watched it. Um, Daisy and I actually watched the very, 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 very first rough edit, like, I mean, probably a year before it even went to Sundance. Um, so a lot of like clips and mostly clips and things like really not edited at all. So we watched that and it was just, it was too, I don't know, it was too rough for us. Not, not in like a necessarily an emotional level, but just like, we are so, we were so protective over each other. So it was like, almost like I was just getting like really angry when it was like on her scenes and things like that and vice versa. So we ended up not ever actually watching the real like final film of it, um, which I mean, I know what happens. She Like yeah. we both were like, well, we already know like how it ends. So we didn't really find a need to do it. But um, I mean, if I, I probably, I mean, I probably would now. I just, I don't find, again, I don't find a reason to. Um, but just in terms of getting involved with it, um, Daisy and I were friends. Well, I reached out to her, I mean, probably like 2013, 12, 13, something like that. And then the film started, we started filming in like 15, I want to say. So, um, and she kind of reached out to me and was like, hey, like, you know, I'm doing this film. Do you want to be involved? And I was like, to be honest with you, no. <laughs> um, but I was like, if you want me to be involved and like be there for you, like I'll do it, you know? And ultimately it turned out to be a great thing because while, you know, for after the release of the film, she, you know, had to travel all over the country and they brought me too. So like the two of us could be together. And so that was like a really surreal experience um, just in and itself, but I was really grateful to have her and vice versa. So um, it was a really eye-opening experience just being in the film, um, especially like when we did the panels and stuff after it was released and just meeting, I mean, hundreds of survivors and just hearing hundreds of different stories. And, you know, it was very overwhelming. Um, we had to kind of learn how to compartmentalize, but we were still both so young. I mean, we were both still in our teens when it came out. So we were just, you know, try, trying to overcome what we had gone through. And then, you know, now it's this whole nother level of publicity where, you know, I literally was in um, an Aruban, I went to Aruba and in Aruban airport, somebody recognized me and like messaged me on Instagram and was like, are you in Aruba? Like so random, like that is just, and I'm like, well, this is awkward, you know? So like so, so random things like that would happen. And it's not, that's not my comfort level. I'm not somebody that's like, look at me, look at me. So like when things would happen like that, it would almost like trigger me. And I'd be like, that's not me. I don't know who that is. That's not me. And when, except, and Daisy started out like that, but after a while she kind of got used to it and she, but I'm glad she did because she used it to her advantage to help, you know, educate. And, and ultimately I, agreed to start speaking out publicly and things like that with her, um, which was also a surreal experience. But ultimately I think it it's so important, even just like watching the film and seeing clips and things like that, that it's like the, the trauma of it happening might be over, but it's still continuously coming up in our lives and we're still facing day, I mean, daily triggers and, you know, reminders and things like that, where it's, you know, it's not just all of a sudden we go public with our stories, we tell it and we're, we're good, we're good to go. You know, her and I both still, I mean, battle, I mean, really almost on a daily basis, but I think that's why we had such a strong bond. And um, so I was really grateful to have her just throughout that whole process. And um, yeah, I mean, I'm, no. I'm really glad we did it. <laughs> well, and we are too. Uh, this is, it's a public service uh, at such a deep level. Uh, but, you know, one of the elements of the film is this victim blaming, which is just so awful and hard to watch. But how, how what can you tell uh, the, the folks watching and, and survivors about this whole victim blaming game? What, how do you feel about it at this point? Um, honestly, I, it's tough because it's, it's, 
I mean, even, even in my everyday life now, I mean, now I'm in real estate and, you know, I have to be in the public and talking to people and social in a sense, but I still, I mean, to this day, am af almost afraid of social media. And it's not that I think that, you know, old, you know, people from high school are going to comment late. It's not that at all. It's just, I had such a bad experience of feeling like I was so to blame for everything that was happening that even now, after it's been, you know, so many years, I still hesitate to post any photo. And it's not just because I'm like nervous about what I look like. Like it has nothing to do with that, but it has everything to do with just my name posting an image or anything associated with that because the backlash in my childhood was so severe and it was so traumatic. And I say to this day that the re-traumatization of the bullying and the harassment that I faced was far worse than the actual trauma itself than actual sexual assault any day of the week. It was, um, I mean, it's, I went through EMDR and I was able to kind of more or less learn how to compartmentalize my trauma. But I mean, I'm still, again, it's an everyday, you know, battle in terms of learning how to trust again and learning how to trust people and trust people's reactions, you know, especially with the digital age and things changing constantly. So I think it's just important that, you know, there's a group of people and a group of communities that really band together to try to kind of, you know, amp up survivors and create like a community that's strong and supportive of survivors, because that's ultimately the best way to combat, you know, online harassment for sure. Well, uh, let me go to uh, Margaret Maybe, uh, who is with the Marsh Law Firm. And James Marsh uh, is really the leading litigator in the country on online exploitation issues. There's no question about it. Maggie's a force of her own in this space. Um, so I, I wanted to ask you, you know, uh, one of the issues we deal with in the space of child sex assault, teen sex assault is, okay, we need to get them justice. It, it, it can't be enough to just say something, but we want to get them justice. But how should lawyers deal with clients who have dealt with these really difficult issues? Yeah, I mean, the, the number one thing I wish I could say to our clients is to find good therapy and we'll help you do that because it's so important to have someone who's skilled in the ways that you need to heal because I think and Delaney can speak on this living in litigation is is very hard it is a very difficult process to seek justice and you need support that comes in all different ways and lawyers are not always trained in the ways that we need to be to be supportive a lot of litigation is requiring really emotionally intensive work and very hard discussions and um if you don't build the right kind of trust with your clients, it's going to cause a lot of harm. So I think one of the things that Delaney can speak on is, you know, what's it like to be a child and having to teach lawyers that these crimes and these harms are distinct. So, you know, you're a victim of child sex abuse, and then you're a victim of this other bullying and perhaps the image going online. And what do those different damages look like? And how do you help your lawyer understand that? Um, when there are not a lot of lawyers in this field, you know, particularly dealing with child sex abuse, but then also dealing with image abuse. So, um, you know, we want to raise awareness. We want to talk. About it. We also need to make sure that we're consistently coming from a trauma informed perspective, um, because the last thing I want to do is put my clients through more hurt than they came to me with. Right, right. And, and for good reason. Um, the. Um, Dr. Liz Goldman uh, has a lively practice in this arena, in this very arena. And, um, you know, what I'd like to ask you, Liz, is how do you help clients understand, you know, intellectually and emotionally that it wasn't their fault? That's a good question. And certainly, you know, I think that this comes up all the time because there's a lot of internalized blame that. Um, victims often feel that they had something to do with this, that they um, were in some way, in some part, responsible, as though the perpetrator wasn't the only one at fault here. And in terms of trying to get patients to not believe that they're at fault, you know, in my experience, both with my patients and, and really clearly in the media, and I kind of use this to try to help my, my patients in this regard, 
I find that people want to blame victims, whether consciously, whether it's unconsciously or a little bit of both. Um, I, I think that people don't want to think that crimes or assaults are gonna happen to them. So it's easy for other people to say like, oh, there, there had to be something that this victim did. There had to be some reason why this assault happened. So if, if people want to believe that assaults are preventable because they wanna believe that somehow it won't happen to them, it becomes a real problem in society. So I try to work with my patients and look at this from um, a perspective that this is not their fault, um, but instead a fault in society. And um, there's this human need. I, I believe there's this human need to believe that somehow we can control our destinies and that there's this you know, magic set of rules. If we do the right thing, if we do a good thing, we're not gonna get assaulted. So therefore, you know, a, a victim had to have been doing something in some way. I think people wanna tell themselves um, in order to, so as, as though they deserve a bad consequence. So mm -hmm. um, obviously I work with my patients individually about their specific situation, their, their story. And I, and I listen and we unpack that. But I think that by trying to frame it in some ways, at least by trying to frame it as a societal construct that survivors can be, just be set up to be blamed just because there's this, this kind of human drive for self-preservation um, and that victim blaming really doesn't have anything to do with the victim at all. Um, I, I think it does give, at least, at least I, I think it does give some patients a sense that they're not really, um, that they're, they're part of a product of, 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 a, of a larger problem, that they are not even being looked at, that um, people want to self-preserve, so they just want to blame victims. And I think in some ways that does help people look at it as a no-win situation, that they're doomed from the get-go, that some, somewhere people are going to be thought that um, attributing fault to the victim. Well, Delaney, you know, I, I'm sure that as you've been through these experiences, you've developed some opinions about how the world needs to change. Um, and so if someone gave you a magic wand, what would be the change or changes that you would like to see right now? I mean, how long do you have? I, <laughs> well, I said change or changes. I, I didn't say all of them. But. <laughs> um, to be honest, the, the, and I think, actually, and I, I know that if Daisy were here, she would agree with me completely, but the biggest thing that we always advocated that impacted us more than anything else was the people that saw what was happening and did nothing. And I mean, even just online harassment, even just you know, victimizing us again, the people who would be scrolling on Facebook and see the memes that were created of us and, you know, keep scrolling you know, but it were the two or three people that reported that meme that mm -hmm. I have more respect for than anything because they saw something, they knew it was wrong and they did something about it. You know, it may not have gotten removed, but they did something about it. And if every person who had scrolled past that meme had reported it, it would have been gone. And I think that just advocating others to learn how to change that cultural shift and, and change the culture of victimizing victims and and believing that it won't happen to us and that you know once it, if it does happen to us then we should just get over it move on it's fine you know it's been 10 years it's been 20 years you know you should be fine like that almost like denial mentality is the biggest thing that i would change in the people who stand by and don't have the courage um or the knowledge or the training to step in and prevent further abuse or harassment from happening um, or prevent it altogether. Because I mean, I can tell you it wasn't have people school reaching out to me now. I mean, it's been so many years, but I have people reaching out to me now saying, you know, hey, like I just wanted to reach out and apologize. Like I would see it in the hallways, but you know, I just, I didn't know what to do. And it's like, that's great, but where were you then? You know what I mean? Like, right. and, I, and for most people, you know, especially when they say, you know, I didn't know what to do. I, I understand that because we were young. Like I get that. And that's why I really enjoy, you know, going to schools and teaching this criteria or this curriculum because it's so important to explain these are the things that you can do. You don't have to jump in with and start throwing your fist. Like you don't have to go and be a tattletale. Like there are so many options that you can do that step in and intervene that can prevent further trauma for that person. 
and you have no idea how much of an impact it can make in the long run. And I think, I mean, truthfully, AIDS would agree with this. One person had stepped in, you know, in all of it, in any part of it, that it would have changed our entire lives. We would have felt like, okay, somebody's standing behind me, but nobody ever did. And that was, you know, the result, you know, you can clearly see in the film, it just, it changed who, the core of who we were and are, I mean, truthfully. And I think that that would be, if there was one thing in the world that I would change, it would be to increase the education about mental health, bystander intervention, and just giving, you know, younger generations the tools of how to step in. Yeah, that bystander problem is such a difficult one. Um, but I, I want to talk to Dr. Cooper. So what is it? Um, you know, I, I love what Delaney just said. Uh, the problem was the people who didn't lift a finger, right? And, right. and knew they should have. So how do we deal with that? I know you think about these issues in the cultural context and the big picture. How do, how do we address that? Well, first of all, um, systems such as school systems, youth serving organizations, uh, other individuals who have contact with youth need to talk about the fact that we live in a society that normalizes sexual harm. Right. It normalizes it. Uh, it's in video games. It's in movies on in the theaters. It's on all of the um, not all, but a lot of Netflix types of movies. It normalizes sexual harm. And um, it therefore teaches bystanders to remain bystanders and not become upstanders. You know, in, in fact, in media, so often when a person does stand up to do the right thing, um, they are in the media ma model ridiculed and uh, told, you know, take a walk, something's wrong with you, et cetera. They, in the end of the movie, may end up being the hero or the heroine, but in the beginning, they're not depicted in that manner. And we really need to rewrite those scripts so that uh, we are really honoring those students, those peers who are going to be really standing by. We're here for the purpose of keeping everybody safe. And this is not safety, this is harm in the nth degree. I think another piece of it has to do with the um, nature of the school uh, authorities because many times school authorities will blame a victim. And uh, that can be extraordinarily, oh, just really terrible, especially if a victim is a reasonably good student, has aspirations. I have uh, been in cases where school authority says, well, you know, if we do anything about this, you probably won't get to go to the college you wanted to go to. This is gonna blemish your record. Um, there are all of these hidden threats uh, to a victim uh, that do them significant harm. Um, and I think one other problem, and thank you, Delaney, so much for all of the things that you have been saying. They, they are just so on point. Um, I think healthcare providers are unaware of what they should and could be doing to help um, our patients. Um, we need to be providing more training to physicians um, because many mental health care providers are not necessarily available. There are a lot of states that don't have a lot of healthcare provider capabilities. So um, from my perspective, I when I approach uh, survivors in situations like this, I want to talk to them about how I want them to be well. And what can we do to get you into a wellness model? Because at the time that I first see them, I know that they're in a toxic stress mode. And I don't want to see them slip into autoimmune disorders and other types of ongoing uh, problems that they would never recognize are not psychological. They're not. They're not. These are um, young people who develop peripheral neuropathies of their wrists and elbows and knees and uh, can develop ongoing irritable bowel symptoms, lots of um, for real medical problems that have to be addressed. And I think if there is, is a um, method of training healthcare providers to show not only empathy, but also be part of, I wanna keep you safe. I want your body to be safe so that as you get through this very difficult time, you won't have to worry at least about being sick as well as having all of these other things that are happening to you. 
So I think we have a lot to do in our society to bring these points to the table to our whole community so that we can help everyone in this situation. I, I, it's it's daunting, um, but also, but I do think there are there are tools out there that we we're trying. Um, and uh, Maggie, some of those tools are um, whistleblower protections or mandated reporting. Do you view those as essential to this universe? Absolutely. So a lot of what Delaney and Dr. Cooper and Dr. Goldman were saying is that we need to get to the people who are on the front lines. And one of the things that we do when we're trying to solve this problem or get a victim justice to say, okay, who was on the front lines and how can we hold them accountable for doing nothing? And if you have mandated reporting requirements, if you have people who are the ones who see the kids when they're in that trauma response mode and they ignore it, they need to be held accountable for that because that's the only go way you're going to change the system and require that they start to take a more active involvement and they start to stop this kind of abuse before it happens. Agreed. So I, so you know, I, I've got some questions from the audience. So let me um, get started on some of these uh, with all the great uh, foundation that you all have already laid. Um, one of them is that you know Bob Allard at the beginning, the attorney who was uh, speaking to us early on, um, said one way to prevent abuse is that we need to teach children compassion and human decency. Who is responsible for teaching children this? And what else can be done? What you know, Delaney? Let me just start with you. Who who should be teaching uh, the kids? The just I mean, basically, what you were asking is, why don't you treat me with decency? Who's responsible for that? It's it's tough because I think that every I mean, every single I mean, my parents are bulldogs in terms of like they you know went to people's, uh, you know, house and knocked on their door and said, you know, your child saying about my child online, like, you know, it'd print out. They went a little overboard, but every, I mean, every parent that answered the door response was a, not my kid. That's not, that didn't happen to my kid, not my kid, because they just, that, you know, their child is perfect or their child would never do something like, that, even when the proof is right there in front of them. With parents, truthfully, it does. It starts with parents, um, and it starts with parents being educated about digital media, truthfully, um, and how it works. Because I can tell you, my parents trying to understand Instagram is just like a whole nother bog. Like they are just like, heck no. I mean, let a TikTok and whatever the most recent thing is. Like, just I think just having like some sort of continuous guide for parents themselves on how these how these systems work and how these the latest greatest coolest thing how they work and how you know your child can have you know a secret account and things like that where you know I think that you know oh my my kid's Facebook's fine and you know it, 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 he doesn't say anything and you know but there's so many ways to hide things on Facebook so educating parents first and foremost about the digital media and age and again yeah law enforcement, healthcare providers, everybody, it, every adult that has an interaction with a child. And I think, you know, even when I, it happened to me the next morning, I went to Parenthood and I, I remember like the, I, I mean, Planned Parenthood, you would think that, I mean, this was also 10 years ago, but you would think that they'd be the most educated on right. responses like this, because this is, I mean, they see this thing all the time, essentially, but Obviously, I when I, I'm not going to walk in there and say, "Oh, this happened to me." So I was so quiet and I was just so reserved. And she was like, "Okay, well, how many partners did you have?" And I was like, and I literally had to sit there and tell her partners, like, I'm two. And she just, I remember her stopping and she's like, "How old are you? Like, two partners? Good lord!" And I'm just like, "Oh my god!" And so that was like the beginning of being re-traumatized, and that was also the beginning of me believing that it was my fault. And had she been able to recognize the signs of, okay, that this girl is quiet, she's reserved, you know, maybe I should ask a little bit more questions or, you know, maybe just dip, there's different techniques and different ways to kind of pull more information out of people. Um, and I think that 
that would have changed a lot of things. You know, it, it would have helped me a lot down the road in just terms of being my self-worth and like that. Yeah. But I think that that's amazing. And then uh, law enforcement as well. I mean, honestly, they, I mean, the whole West coast of um, California, my County that I was in, they now require every detective that and every new detective to watch I'd, on Daisy because they want right. these detectives to stay on top of understanding digital media, understanding social networking and social media and things like that. I, I mean, I think that's a huge step up because mm -hmm. you know, law enforcement, you know, kids respect law enforcement and they're like, oh, you know, if he's telling me, you know, they, they understand and they listen more than our parents would say necessarily. So I think that it starts with parents, teachers, I mean, counselors, any, any interact action with a child should be educated on just how to respond and how to look for signs, truthfully. I am so sorry to hear that your first, you know, frontline responder that you dealt with would would feed into the whole victim blaming universe. That's that's sad. Um, I'm really sorry that you had to go through that. Honestly, like it wasn't. It, I it made me angry for a long time, but ultimately, like she she was trained. She wasn't educated. So I I, right. I, I, and I understand that now looking back, but ultimately like it would have changed my whole world being a kid, a young child and walking in there, not even knowing what happened. And, you know, kind of having recognized that and be like, this is, this is what needs to happen. You know, that would have changed a lot of things. So kind of started my motivation to like, okay, this needs, something needs to change here because this should not have happened. No, no, it shouldn't have. So, um, so, so Liz, so, you know, so we're talking about, um, Sharon Cooper says, look, um, we got to educate doctors and Delaney's really focusing on parents. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, in, in, in your universe, what, who do we need to be educating or changing? You know, it's one thing to educate. It's another thing to change people. Who do we need to be changing to make this a better world for kids? Well, I agree very much with what Dr. Cooper, with what Dr. Cooper and Delaney have said. I think that parents, schools, institutions, any any adult around children, healthcare providers, uh, police forces, everybody. I mean, I've um, in my work with patients, it's also in changing the concept that survivors have about themselves that also can be extremely instructive and extremely helpful. And you know, victim blaming comes in so many forms, obviously really tormented when people have online um, you know, added horrible re-traumatization. I, I feel like if, if there's a way to work with victims, or, or I should say survivors, I like survivors better, but interchangeably, you know, when, when, when survivors um, are not educated themselves about how they might feel differently and how they can experience something different from um, victim blaming, I, I, yeah, I think that that's an opportunity. And that's an opportunity that um, I think also needs to be expressed in a cultural way in our society. I think that when, when victims are silenced or if they're bullied or if they're afraid to report or if they're questioned about what happened in some kind of way as though there's some debate or as though it couldn't have really happened in, in the way that they that they described it, then they begin to internalize it as though right. you know, in some ways that they're at least partially to blame. And, you know, unfortunately, I think that survivors are typically not told that no matter what they were doing, no matter what they were wearing, no matter what the, they were drinking, you know, anything that would happen to them was not their fault. And I think it's important to educate survivors that too, that it's not their fault. They didn't deserve it. And you know, I find that um, survivor patients of mine who uh, struggle with this message, they're the ones who particularly internalize blame, get stuck with that, and that educating those survivors about how they can experience their assault, their, their re-traumatization, all of it differently. I think that in some ways, if they don't believe that they're responsible for what happened to them, that education unto itself can be tremendous and tremendously helpful for survivors, and uh, you know, I, I, I can think of, I've heard so many, so, so sad, right? I've heard so many survivor stories from my patients and they torture themselves with these, these, these way they phrase things that uh, if only I did this or, or if only I didn't do that, 
And I think that, that that's part of this, uh, you know, internalization that if, if, if there's any, if only that should have any meaning. And I'd like to educate, you know, my survivors about this, that the if, if only shouldn't be about anything that the person themselves has done. It's about if only my offender didn't assault me. That's the only valid, if only that there should be. Right. So I think that there's a level of also educating um, survivors to have them not just fall into the easy trap of self-blame. And that has that, that message has to obviously be through par to parents and schools and mental health care providers and society. And really, uh, social media is just horrible. It just absolutely dismisses the validity of um, having people think for themselves and not be just blamed outright because it's so easy to do that with the anonymity of strangers online. So uh, absolutely. Uh, Maggie, you um, threw in a comment that said, and this is a favorite of mine, um, how about the tech industry? So yeah. how the heck do we rein in the tech industry so it will quit re-victimizing everyone? Absolutely. So I think that everything we've talked about today is so important and there's a lot of the, the direct services that we do need to change, but there's also this bigger overarching problem of all of this stuff that's happening on social media and happening online, all of the platforms, all of the Facebook and Twitter and YouTube, those people make a lot of money off of this and they have no reason to stop it from happening. In fact, they have every reason to encourage it and to encourage that constant reclicking and resharing of, or also just failing to monitor the abusive behavior and child sex abuse material that exists online. And the reason that these platforms and the tech industry have no real reason to regulate is because they have a benefit of what's called the Communications Decency Act and it's section 230 of that act. What it does is essentially provide them with immunity for any liability that happens on these platforms. Um, and, and so there's no way to sue any of the social media providers for what happened to Delaney. There's no way to show them that they really enabled that, that second harm to her. Um, she was abused and then that abuse was made so much worse by this availability of all of the comments and clicks and the constant pressure of all of that, which really infiltrated itself into her social life and in school. Um, yeah, it would have gone around the, the schoolyard, um, but there's a bigger impact when it goes around the world. And we need to understand the gravity of that and hold tech accountable for what's happening to our kids. I completely agree. Uh, I mean, I, I think that it's inevitable. We have to get there um, and to make them responsible. Uh, but um, and and in, so in some ways, the talk about decency is how about some decency from the tech industry, right? Why are, why are they blameless? Why, why are they um, supposed to be just doing wonderful things for us uh, while they permit this kind of harm? So I just uh, thank you. I, yeah, please. Yeah, when I when I file these lawsuits, they feel as if any um, ask for decency is is me saying that we should send the internet, and and that's not what we're getting at. There's ways right. to exist online right. where you are decent and you are protecting kids. That doesn't mean we have government control over the internet, right? It's allowed to exist in both ways, and we need to um, end that fallacy that any regulation online is going to be the worst thing in the world because I think it could make it so much better for especially people under 18. Yeah, yeah well, even you know, I, I, sorry, go, go ahead, Delaney. No, I just wanted to piggyback off of what you just said, Maggie, because it, it, it's infuriating that even just recently there's and it doesn't happen too often anymore, but when people post like on my public page or my real estate page or whatever, just something just so unrelated, rude, mean, things like that. It, they, Facebook in a general, and I'm, I mean, I'm sure it's like this on every platform, but Facebook, I know specifically, because I have a lot of, a lot of experience on it. They make it so difficult to report, to get of comments. I mean, if it's your personal you know, page or whatever, you can delete it all. But then I have to stay on top of it and 
be monitoring all the time. And then I see even more stuff. So it's, it's ridiculous where it's like, and so luckily recently they created this like profanity filter or whatever, but again, there's ways around that too. And then yeah. things like, even just my, with my page, you know, people are leaving me reviews and they make it so hard to, you know, when I would report a review that was completely unrelated to anything that had to do with anything, it was literally just like, oh, you're a, you know, and then whatever word it like they just make it so difficult and then even when I was younger when I would report oh this person posted on my on my page you know I'm going to report them they would it would take weeks to get stuff removed and by then it's like we'll just leave it on there you know it's, it's already been screenshotted and reposted and reshared and it just they make it so hard when it's not a difficult or it shouldn't be and I think that that's where it, it starts it should be a default Right. Exactly. I mean, this is just this. This is the default, not the let's make sure everybody can be mean to someone else. Mm -hmm. But I have talked to so many survivors who are out of the statute of limitations, so they can't go to court. They can't get the protections of the of the legal system and they are being harassed by their perpetrators or by the institution that perpetrated against them. And social media is an ugly weapon. Uh, mm -hmm. and it's so hard to avoid. So we, we really need to work on that. And I, I, you know, we're so busy talking. I keep forgetting I've got audience questions. Jill, I'm sorry. I'm going back to my appointed duties here. Um, uh, question for Dr. Goldman. Uh, I am a registered nurse pursuing my psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner licensure. How will I help a person who has experienced child sex abuse to not only survive, but thrive? in their lives. And by the way, you are the reason I'm pursuing my advanced nursing degree. Oh my gosh. Lovely. That's really nice. Well, I better have a really good answer, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I think that some things really can't be trained and that sounds like a really sad thing to say. I mean, people have compassion, they have to offer that compassion. And I think if you have a heart, if you're even asking the question of how am I going to be able to provide the kind of heartfelt, meaningful, you know, psychiatrically, emotionally savvy care. I think by asking the question, I think you're going to be prepared to um, really look at the complexity of every individual as that, as an individual, to listen, to listen truly non-judgmentally, to not shortchange a person the opportunity to tell their story, to not dismiss it, to not nitpick it, to really allow the person to describe what happened and look at it from the lens of you know, psychiatric diagnoses and symptomatology. I mean, people who have been you know, sexually assaulted and victimized are prone to have so many, a slew of all kinds of psychiatric symptomatology from you know, uh, helplessness, worthlessness, uh, you know, suicidality, clearly lots of depression, um, anxiety in so many forms, panic, sleeplessness, insecurity about attachments, um, behavioral manifestations, eating disorders, substance abuse. So I think just really having an eye out for um, who is this patient or who are these patients advocates? How can you be an advocate? How can you help this person, whether it's through means that um, you, know, you don't have yourself, like contacting a lawyer, just like um, Maggie, you were saying earlier that you want your clients to get good psychiatric help. You know, I, I'm not going to pretend that I'm a lawyer. So for some of my patients, obviously, I need them to get resources outside of myself. Um, but I think that just being aware of just the, the, the far reaching implications, um, psychiatrically, emotionally, behaviorally of patients, I think that uh, that's really the, the key to being um, part of the journey alongside somebody and getting them the help that they deserve. Fabulous. Um Dr. Cooper, um, a question for you. Um, in continuing to think about medical professionals in particular, are there specific ways we can educate providers of all specialties in how to approach patients in a patient first and trauma centered way? In other words, the opposite of what Delaney experienced. Um, for example, could we start this as early as med school or make it a part of continuing hours of education? I mean, is there a mechanism that you would endorse? 
Yes, there is. Um, first of all, I think that healthcare providers, it doesn't matter what kind of healthcare provider you are, uh, sh what we should do is we should make a training, a series of training videos on how to provide anticipatory guidance to parents and children, starting from the zero to three age range and from the three to seven age range and from the seven to 11 age range to talk about how to keep your child safe online. And, and doing it as a safety message, you know, parents are very accustomed to, oh yeah, seat belts and, you know, other types of things that, they, that we talk to them about as far as well child care. Um, we would wanna talk about this too. And I begin that, I begin that dialogue with my zero to five-year-old, my parents of zero to five-year-olds under the guise of digital diet. You know, tell me about where your child is going online and what kinds of things are they watching and are you with them and do they have their own devices? And, you know, as the children get a little bit older, um, we can talk to family medicine doctors, to pediatricians, to internal medicine folks, because as children get older and become adolescents, the other th thing that happens is that um, puberty begins around, it begins around eight to nine years of age for girls in the United States. And when you recognize that that's the onset of breast development, they become even more at risk for individuals to reach out to them in an effort to establish a relationship in the, in the online world. Uh, so I, I often talk to parents about how do you monitor? Here's a free app that you can download for your phone so that you can see everything that your child is doing uh, and where they're going and who's talking to them. And I think that um, helping to educate healthcare providers of this not hard and not scary type of training for parents because parents we know you want to keep your child safe and we want you to keep it we want to help you keep your child safe in cyberspace and these are some of the things that we want to do i absolutely think it should be part of uh, not only continuing med medical education but woven in in well child care Mm -hmm. so that it's a routine phenomenon uh, before it becomes um, a, a huge issue because there has been an incident. Right. Well, um, that's, uh, I, I think, I, I love the phrase digital diet. Uh, that, that, that medicalizes what, you know, seems like this amorphous tech, but really it is, you know, you got to eat your peas and your carrots and you can't have 18 hours a day on that. Amen. <laughs> Love it. Love it. So Maggie, um, uh, is Delaney okay? <laughs> yeah, I, I think Delaney just had to, to jump out for a moment. She might okay. be back. Um, I'm here. I'm sorry. I had to go. I had All to right. run. Into so I'm good. Hi. No, no problem. No problem. Just making sure everything's okay. Yeah, We're yeah, fine. yeah. <laughs> so Delaney, uh, I was just about to turn to you anyway. Um, so if you're talking to an audience here tonight, and, uh, and I know you've been talking to audiences for a long time, really. Um, how, do you, how do you see the future uh, for yourself? I mean, is this, is this like becoming the cause for you, or are you just kind of ready to just move on? And um, wh where does this fit into the way you see your future? I... <sighs> It's, it's tough. I, I took about a year off of just any activism, any speaking engagements or anything um, a few years ago because I really just needed it for my mental health, for emotionally, everything. Um, it was actually, ironically, the same year I was going through my civil court and everything. So it was through depositions and it was just a lot all at once. Yeah. And um, so I needed to take that time off. And, but when... I, you know, when I actually, I took that time off, it was almost like I missed it and not in a way where it was like, I, you know, missed having so much fun because it's never fun necessarily to talk about these issues, but it, it's so fulfilling. And every time somebody shares their story with me, I'm like, I'm so honored because I know how hard it is to share your story with anyone. And so it, it makes me happy and I love doing it. Um, I mean, I'll, Honestly, I'll be involved in this topic, this issue, essentially for the rest of my life. Hopefully, I won't have to be. Hopefully, the culture will shift and, the, and things will change. <laughs> but essentially, I even, if, even when it does, because I'm very positive thinking, even when it does, it's still going to always be, you know, the tech world and tech industry is always going to be changing. There's always going to be something new. And, you know, so the education is never going to need 
to end. It's never going to need to stop. We're never going to hit a peak where it's like, oh, okay, we've, we've hit our max, you know, everything that we can educate people on, we're good to go. It's never yeah. going to get there. So it's interesting to, it's, and it's, I, I to be honest, I stopped talking a while after this past year, just when um, Daisy died, it just, I, it was, it was a tough time for me. Um, and I think that it, 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 I mean, I told everyone I'm never speaking again. I'm never, I can't, I can't do it I, because we, we did it together. Like it was like our thing, you know, but ultimately it was almost like I was not doing her justice by doing that, by not speaking out. And I felt like you know, I was less connected to her by doing that. So every time I do speak or do talk about her and, or share her story, I really try to, you know, remind people that, you know, it's, it, you're always healing. You're always, there's never going to be a time where, you know, you're just over it. You're good. Cause things always come up and you're, it's life. Life is hard and things happen, you know, and it might not be that trauma, but it, maybe it's another trauma that, you know, occurs in your life. Like you have to learn how to cope and, important to recognize that there are people out there that are still struggling, even when they may appear to not be. And so I think that I'm always going to be sharing her story and I'm always going to be speaking out because it's really important to me. And it's just something that I, you know, have done with Daisy for so long. And our, our motto, our like go-to thing was always that we do this for Audrey. We do this for Audrey because Audrey can mm -hmm. Well, now it's just me and it's like, you know, it's almost like, okay, well now I have to do it for Daisy and I have to do it for Audrey. So that, that's kind of where I get my strength and I get my motivation to be able to do this, yeah. you know, periodically, you know, when I can, but I do take, you know, and, and time to kind of just self-reflect and, and make sure that I'm okay mentally before, you know, I jump in and yeah. start speaking out major again. So that is such a wonderful message for survivors. They are not required 24 seven to be a part of this movement. In fact, some don't need to be part of it at all because they can't handle it. It's too hard. Um, you are obviously an extraordinarily strong woman um, who has uh, survived the unthinkable, frankly. So I want to give you so much credit. And I mean, I hope you'll continue to share your voice, but I also hope, you know, you'll just take the time you need for you because um, it, it's, do. it's a heavy burden. It's yeah. a heavy burden to carry. Yeah. So, happy so to Maggie, speak up with you. we're happy to speak up with you. You never have to do it alone. And if you want someone to speak up in your place, Marcy will do it too. <laughs> we're here to pass on the message. Yeah, well, yeah, no, I know it's true. I do keep talking, but that wasn't really the point. The point was that uh, that this group that you are looking at on screen, everybody is, and I'm going to take myself out of this, a bunch of heroes. Um, uh, Liz, Liz, Sharon, Maggie, Delaney, you are wonderful people. I love the fact that we get to get together, even if we don't get to get together. And I just want to thank each and every one of you. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, we're going to, we've recorded this, we're going to share it. Um, and we want to get the message out that this has to stop because it does. So thank you so much. I hope everyone has a wonderful evening and uh, we will be back in the fall for our next film event. So I hope everybody has a lovely summer. And a big thank you to you, Marcy, for putting this all together. Thank you so much. You are as much a hero as anyone here, and we really depend on you to get this message out. Yeah. Well, if you say, if you talk to Jill Ruck and Nicole Brigstock and the other 20 people at Child USA, you'd know I don't do it alone. It's a team. <laughs> so thanks, everybody. Thank Check you, out ChildUSA.org. And like I said, have a great summer. Great. Thank Good you. night. Good night.